Hi, welcome back. Today I'm going to be telling you how to make a halving joint, which is what I use to make this frame. And there's a video elsewhere on this channel about making this frame. So I'm going to be demonstrating the joint that's used there. I'm going to be introducing some saws, which we haven't used yet. There are also other videos on saws on this channel, so that's worth a bit of uh, checking out if you're interested in that. I'll also be introducing chisel and a little bit of marking out equipment. So, I hope you enjoy it. Also, did you finish off your puzzle? I finished off mine from last time. So to tidy up my jigsaw pieces, I'm using some sandpaper wrapped around a dowel just to ease off the edges on the curved surfaces. That's all very easy. And then for the straight surfaces, I'm gonna use a flat piece of sandpaper on the bench. Just with the grain, just puts a little chamfer on the edge, takes away the sharpness. Now when you're sanding, you should try and go with the grain. You see the grain is going in this direction, so I'm sanding, pulling it in the direction of the grain. When I do what's the end grain, the uh, direction of the grain is this way. I want to do that surface, so across the grain. So I pull that end surface across like so. That does all the edges nicely. To do the faces, flat on the paper, and just in the direction of the grain again, until you get rid of all your pencil marks and any scratches that might be on there. Now sandpaper comes in lots of different grades, uh, determined by the grit size. There's a numbering system, and it's uh, not particularly sensible. It goes from the smaller the number, the bigger the grain, to the larger the number, the smaller the grain. So fine sandpaper has a very high number, and a very coarse sandpaper has a low number. And for woodworking, you'll be working with probably grits of between about 60 and 400 in most cases. And when you sand, you start, if you've got a very scratched surface, start with a coarse paper to take out the, the larger scratches. That will leave smaller scratches, so then you move down to the next numbered paper, or up, up in uh, value of numbers, to the finer grade of paper. Take out those scratches and put in a new set of finer scratches, and you keep going uh, to the number, the grit number, gets probably about 240 or so, and you'll start to see all the scratches disappear. And you can keep going on after that if you need to. And that's finished, you can dust those off and put a finish on it. Maybe a paint, maybe a varnish, or maybe an oil. I'm gonna finish this one off with some oil. And this is uh, Oddy's oil. It goes an awful long way, so you don't need much of it. It smells lovely. But there are lots of alternatives. You could use tongue oil. You could use uh, boiled linseed oil. The process is pretty much the same. You apply the finish. Leave it a little while. And then rub off as much excess as you can and uh, each of the oils will have its own little guideline for how much, how long to leave it on for and how soon you can recoat. And as you can see, the oils bring out lovely finish of the wood. So there's the finished puzzle. I think it looks quite nice. You can see possibly down here where I started sawing using the coping saw, slightly wider kerf, and the rest of it where I used either the fret saw or the scroll saw is quite nice and tight. So let's make a halving joint. Now, when you see halving joints like this frame, uh, in a lot of cases, the dimensions of the pieces joined together tend to be the same. Now, that need not be the case. And uh, you can see how I make this frame in another video on this channel. But I'm gonna be doing a demonstration where the pieces definitely aren't the same. So these two pieces are different heights and they're different thicknesses. The procedure, pretty much the same. Uh, the one thing you need to determine at the start is uh, what area or where that extra height is going to end up. Now I build the frames off the bench top upwards, 
So I'm going to be putting this together so that the bottom, as it goes together, is all flush on the bench, and so this higher component will be sticking out above the other one. That's all you need to determine straight away. The principle of the halving joint is that we take away half the material in one piece in its height and half of the other piece in its height such that when the two pieces go together that joint is closed up and uh, we end up flush on one side, it's flush on the bottom in fact. And when you've got different heights that half only actually refers to one of the pieces and it will be the, the shorter piece, this piece here. So we'll cut half of that away and then we'll cut the same amount or we'll leave the same amount in the other component so that when they go together it's flush on the back and the joints come together tightly. Now hopefully it will become more clear as I do it. Now what equipment do you need to be able to do this? Well you certainly need a saw I introduced a coping saw last time. Um, you could do it with a coping saw, but a coping saw is really for cutting curves and it doesn't cut particularly well uh, in dead straight lines. So I'd be recommending you either get yourself a back saw, Japanese saw like this, or a backed western saw like this dovetail saw. Now I've got plenty of videos on sawing on this channel, so if you look at those for backed saws and western versus Japanese saws, there's lots more information on these, but if you get yourself one of those, it'll be ideal for the job. In addition, you'll need a chisel. Um, bevel edge chisel will be fine, they're very common, you find them in most DIY stores. We've got a blade at one end, it's very sharp on the end, and we've got a handle at the other end. The cutting edge is square to the sides of the chisel, and most of the time for this joint, we'll just be pushing the chisel. All that's left really is to discuss how we mark out the joint. Now, I'm going to be using a pencil. There are plenty of marking out devices around and we can get away with just a pencil and probably just a block of wood which is roughly half the height of, of this piece here. So I'll try and find something like that in my bench top scraps. That's a bit too short. That's a bit too high. And that is about right. So I'll put these two pieces together, that will give us a height. And we use the pencil to mark off the height. Now initially I'm going to do this on the end of the wood so you can see the joint in its open state. So that gives me the height, sharp pencil, I can draw across there. And when we're putting a higher piece uh, joined to a thinner piece, like we are here, the higher piece always sits on top in the joint. So we need to remove above the line in this piece. Now the other piece that's joining it, we use exactly the same piece of wood there to gauge where we want to cut that one, put it up against the side, mark it, and we want to remove the material that's below that line. Now how wide do we make the cut? Well we want to make it as wide as the component that it's joining to. So we can do that simply by lining them up at the end and drawing a pencil line along here. For the other one, let's put it the other way up because that's the side we're taking away. Remember we're cutting this piece away pop that one onto there, line the end up and I'll draw on the back side here like so show me how wide that's got to be now we need to join those lines up so we've got the line which tells us how high it goes the line which tells us how far along it goes we've got to join those and be pretty square now the right tool to use for that is an engineer's square or a carpenter's square. I'm assuming at this stage you haven't bought one, but you should have a ruler, and rulers generally have a square end on them. So if we put the ruler on the desk, 
piece of wood down like that. Well, let's just mark around, just transfer that mark to the edge. Rule on the desk, up against that, that gives us a square line, and we can square up. And now you can see we've got the area that we need to remove. Same with the other one, just mark the width at the bottom, the ruler up to that, square up the face, I need to square around this mark for the height as well, I can redo the height with these blocks, so that was there. So that's the area that's going to disappear from this one. Mark the piece that's going to disappear on both of the components all the way around because it's so easy when you start sawing to remove the wrong piece. Now if you continue that uh, marking out around to the other side, so we'll transfer this line up this side with the ruler. and its height again using the height gauging blocks. Mark it as waste and on the end as well. Same with this one. When you think you've marked it out right, put the pieces together and check the marking out lines. And you can see we're removing this top section here down to this point, and then on the other piece, from the same height, we're removing what's below it. So they should go together fine. So the next thing to do is to cut them out. I'm going to be using a bench hook to hold it whilst I saw. Uh, these are very easy to make, and again, I've got a video on those earlier on in this channel. Basically that hooks on the bench, it gives you something to hold your piece of work whilst you're cutting. I'm going to use a Japanese saw here. I'm going purely to the pencil lines. There are more accurate ways to do this and I'll show you that later in the series. For the time being I'm going to cut with the Japanese saw. I'm going to line that up with my thumb to the pencil line. Gently start cutting. And now I've cut across the front, what I'm going to do now is put that piece of wood down and cut down that line to the, the halfway point that we've marked. And I'm going to do it the other way as well, down to that halfway point. those saw curves will all help each other as I pull the saw through with it now vertical. It helps to guide the saw nice and straight through the cut. I'll just saw down to when we meet the other line. Checking both sides. That's the one done, swap over to the other one, same thing, let's start a saw curve at the top, go down the face there, and on the reverse, Now what I'm 
going to be doing is chiseling at an angle of about like this, perhaps 45 degrees, maybe a little steeper. Start near the top of what's going to be the notch, remove that section, come back a bit, remove another section, keep going until I get back to that baseline. Then I'm going to flip it over, work from the other side, same thing, remove at about 45 degrees, that leaves me a little triangle left and I can then put it horizontal and gradually pair that away down to the line. So let's start with that side and all I'm going to do is put a little bit of pressure on the chisel and you see how easily that wood just pairs away nearly down to my line. Finally just line the chisel up with the line. Last cut. Like so. Now I'll do the other side. It takes slightly bigger chunks to begin with because some of the material is removed from the other side. down to our line, so final one, now you see we've got a little triangle and I'm going to be paring away the wood horizontally like this against the bench hook. Now this bench hook works the wrong way around because for the pull saw so I'd be working this chisel towards myself which isn't particularly safe. Now putting the bench hook on the front of the bench so the hook is facing me, holding the work the other way around now. I can approach the wood like this horizontally until I get down to that straight line which is going to be the joint line. Now as we get close, uh, we want to be careful how much we take. I'm going to make sure we don't take any more than down to the line. So I'll use two hands here, I'll work from both sides towards the middle, like so, down to my gauge line, or down to the line, which is uh, what we chose to be halfway. Flip it around to the other side, again, work down horizontally. When we get halfway, those chips from the other side will fall off. Final cut goes nice and straight across there. You can see we haven't quite sawn to the bottom. We've still got a few loose little chips in there. So we'll just pair down like so. Those will come away. And that's half the joint done. Exactly the same with the other piece. You can work vertically down like this. Put a little board underneath it so you protect your workbench. Almost there. Now when you've removed half from each piece, you see that they were on a flat surface, 
just slide together nice and tightly like that. The higher piece, higher on this edge, but everything nice and flush on the other side. Now that's a corner halving joint or a corner lap joint because it creates a corner. Uh, for the frame that I did before, we're actually creating a cross. So rather than having the, um, the ends of the wood notched out, we notch out like so within its length both pieces and then they go together like so. It's the same layout. The only tricky thing here is getting the angle right. If you want to make cross halving, it should be at 90 degrees. You can cross out anything you like, but it's just a little bit trickier with the marking out. So to do a cross halving, which is at right angles, I'm going to use uh, the engineer's square just to make sure I am at right angles and I'll put one up at this end so we want to notch in the thicker piece at right angles and it wants to be that wide so we'll mark with a pencil there and against the square that gives us the width of our notch depth of the notch will do exactly the same as we did before we'll use these two little bits of wood to give us a height, mark that on the face, mark it on the reverse as well, and because I've got the square, I'll use the square to square those lines down the front instead of using the ruler on the workbench. Again we just transfer it to the corner so we can see it clearly, move the square up to the mark and the pencil line down to the depth of that notch. Do that both sides. And then for the other piece, I'm going to put it roughly there. So what I need to do is turn it all upside down. We want this square as well, so we use the square again. Position that on there. A little awkward with just two hands. Mark this side, remove it, mark against the square. That's the width of the notch. So these are going to go together this way up. So that's the way we use the heighting, height gauge. So those two bits on there see where my line's going to be, mark the height of that notch, both sides, and square lines down to that. There's the notch, nice tight fit, Let's just cut the notch in the other piece now. And you can see how sharp the edges of these chisels are, it's got a very slight scratch from running down this corner edge of the chisel. that's better. Now those two pieces should go together. There's a little bit of waste left in there. They should go together. 
albeit rather tight. There we go, so flush on the bottom, ready to the top. Nice strong joint. And hopefully it should be pretty square. And by combining the cross halving notch in one piece and the end or corner housing notch, you can actually make what's known as a T halving. So if I get that in there, produce a T. So the final one I'm going to show you is at an angle. So halving joint at an angle. Any angle you like, doesn't matter. I'll pick that angle there, we'll put it in that position. And the way I'm going to do that is to not move it whilst I mark everything up. So I want to mark across there, across the reverse. I also want to mark, this is going to be difficult, underneath on there and on this other side. Like so. And now I want the same thing with the height, so the height blocks again. Pop those on there. Gives us the depth of this notch. And on that side, out there. So use the square to square down those lines. So same process with these, I'll cut them out, saw them down to the lines and chop out the middle. Chopping out the middle a little bit more tricky because you're going at an angle. So chiselling at an angle, a little bit of a problem here. Take much thinner cuts. Just bring that flat now in the middle. Now for this one, because the chiselling is difficult at an angle, I'm going to put an extra cut in through the middle just to make it, just to make the wood come out a bit easier. makes it a lot easier and you can even go for a smaller chisel as well that fits go together a bit looser this time and remember, when you actually glue these things together, the end grain doesn't glue, so it doesn't matter if you're not really tight uh, end grain to, to long grain. It's the long grain to long grain at the bottom of the notches that really does all the good and holds things together. So, there's the halving joint. We did the corn halving, cross halving, and an angled halving. Have a little practice, see what you can come up with. Now I've shown you how to do that with just a saw, chisel, pencil, a ruler, and a little block of wood to gauge the height. There are better ways using a marking gauge, a combination square, or an engineer square, and we'll cover those in another episode. Next time we're going to be talking about actually making a box, and we're going to be doing box joints or finger joints. So join me next time. Cheerio.